It's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker because we are collaborating already for some time. So welcome uh, Siska Grubels from Belgium. Give a hand, please. You just press and it will go. And uh, Siska is a professor at uh, Ghent University. Uh, is specialized in pharmacology and toxicology, right, Siska? Right. And uh, she will uh, discuss with us about uh, mycotoxin interaction on the gut integrity. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and, gen and gentlemen. Uh, as announced, I'm head of the Laboratory of Pharmacology and Toxicology uh, of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at Ghent University. Ghent is situated in the northern part of Belgium. Well, quite a lot of our mycotoxin research is done in close collaboration with the colleagues of the Department of Pathology, Bacteriology and Avian Diseases. Okay, concerning mycotoxins. I guess most of you know mycotoxins, I do hope so. But as you can see, eh, these are toxic compounds produced by different types of fungi amongst which Aspergillus, Fusarium and Penicillium are the most important ones. They have a very diverse chemical structure with diverse chemical properties, but unfortunately this structure is mainly preserved during food and feed processing and during storage. So they keep their toxic properties. When we look to the worldwide occurrence of mycotoxins in feed, and feed raw materials. I can show you many surveys. Actually, I want to invite you to take a look at the poster session in the hall where you can find several posters dealing with these surveys from several years, even recent ones, 2013, 12 and 11. I just show you one example of an eight years survey here, analyzing more than 17,000 samples coming from different parts of the world. And in general, about 70% of these samples tested positive for the presence of one or more mycotoxins. Remarkably, 38% of them were co-contaminated, meaning that more than one mycotoxin was present simultaneously in one sample. The mycotoxins most frequently detected were the fusarium toxins, deoxynivalinol or DON, Fumonizins, next ziaralinone, aflatoxins and okratoxin A. It must be mentioned that concerning the contamination levels, most of the samples were in compliance with at least European recommendations and European regulation for aflatoxins, for instance. You can find this European legislation in these guidelines, guidance here. And for your information, I wrapped up these levels and um, as you can see in the table huh, this legislation or recommendation levels only take into account one single mycotoxin each time. Huh? So in my opinion the problem of the co-contamination huh, is a challenge for future. Huh? What about this additive effects, synergistic maybe or antagonistic effects can be present. So this legislation does not take into account this co-contamination for the moment. When we look to the fusarium mycotoxins more specifically, like DON and fumonizins, the legislation is set as a maximum guidance levels at 5 ppm for DON and 20 ppm for the sum of fumonizin B1 and B2. This slide summarizes then the main toxic effects one could expect of the mycotoxins. There's a very broad range, and for instance, DON and another fusarium toxin, T2 toxin, might give rise to feed refusal and gastrointestinal lesions, mucosal lesions. Like shown in the picture here, the T2 toxin giving rise to these oral uh, mucosal lesions. For aflatoxin, on the other hand, the target tissue is more the liver, giving rise to fatty liver syndrome and immunosuppression. Others can be excreted in, in the eggs. Or others, like okratoxin A, has a specific action 
an affinity for the kidneys. Research up till today made it possible to perform several meta-analyses. For instance, this one published in 2011, where about 100 papers were included. In total, 1,400 diets were examined and more than 37,000 birds. In general, mycotoxins were responsible for a reduction in the feed intake and the body weight gain by about 10 to 15 percent. Of these, mainly okra toxins and aflatoxins exerted the main effect on this performance. On the other hand, when we look to mortality, aflatoxins were responsible for an increase by about three times and done by about eight times. So there is a kind of correlation and an interaction with performance, but this, of course, depends on the type of mycotoxin, the duration of exposure, and the concentration level. Besides this, also other factors like the age, the nutritional factors and general health status of the animals also play a role. Since mycotoxins are feed contaminants, the gastrointestinal tract is the first target for these toxins, of course. Um, it is generally accepted that cells with a high turnover, like immune cells or cells of the small intestine, uh, are most susceptible. In fact, the small intestine has a double role, as you know. Either it must be there for the absorption of water and nutrients, but it also is a dynamic barrier against xenobiotics, so foreign body different compounds um, like toxins or uh, drugs uh, and also pathogens. Here you can see these intestinal epithelial cells. At the apical side, we have the gut lumen and the lamina propria at the basolateral side. Now, mycotoxins in general impair several functions of the intestinal epithelial cell. For instance, DON or DON and fumonisin B1 might increase the permeability by damaging tight junction proteins. The same toxins and also others might alter cytokine production, might impair cell proliferation or even mucus production, and remarkably here for Don, it might even increase immunoglobulin A production. The effect on the antimicrobial peptides is largely unknown today. So again, this made possible these studies to perform a meta-analysis now dealing with the modulation of intestinal functions by mycotoxins. Again, about 100 papers were studied and seven intestinal processes. These processes were, for instance, the enzyme activity, the digestive microflora, the barrier integrity, mucosal immunity, and so on. It is concluded out of this analysis that mycotoxins, and more specifically, DON, DON was most studied of all toxins, at realistic contamination levels can compromise the several functions, digestion to the immune defense. If we have a closer look now, more into detail, to the effect of fusarium mycotoxins on the intestinal mor morphology, more specifically on villus height, for instance, Many researchers agree and found same findings that DON, which is well studied, at levels below or approximating the European maximum guidance value of 5 ppm, that these might impair the villus height, giving a significant reduction. At higher contamina contamination levels above this 5 ppm, similar effects are seen, but not only in duodenum, but also, for instance, in jejunum. So we can conclude here that there's a kind of linear relations, relationship with increasing levels of DON in the feet, one gets decrease in villus height. Concerning turkeys, we have same findings. Again, in duodenum here, a significant reduction in villus heights, and also in the apparent surface area. So this would imply 
that the surface area is reduced with reduced absorption, for instance, of nutrients or drugs that must pass uh, through this barrier. Again, this was done with DON, but T2 toxin, another study uh, in 2003, at rather high contamination levels here, also resulted in the shorter and thin thinner villi in duodenum and jejunum. OK. Next, we move on to the real barrier function of the intestine. Eh? And at several levels, we can study this barrier. Eh? Let's start with the oxidative stress and inflammation. I can show you many examples, but for instance, this in vivo trial is one of them, where one-day-old broilers were fed for three weeks with DON, and sections from mid duodenum jejunum to ilium were collected afterwards, and an RT-QPCR analysis for genes, encoding for several oxidative stress markers, like hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, heme oxygenase, and xanthine oxidoreductase. Here are the results. In the duodenum, we saw no significant effects, but on the other hand, in the jejunum, you can see here, both in the DON group, and a DON group where also a commercial mycotoxin binder or clay mineral was mixed in the feed, we saw similar effects, huh? namely a significant upregulation in gene expression for two of the three markers, heme oxygenase and xanthine oxidoreductase. So this would mean the presence of this oxidative stress. In the same study, other markers were also included now for intestinal inflammation. We selected the genes encoding for toll-like receptor 2 and toll-like receptor 4. And again, in the duodenum, there was a significant upregulation of TLR4 in the DON-only group. And in the jejunum, similar effects, but also in the DON plus the clay group. You can see the clay was only partially uh, responsible for a reduction in the toxic effects. So to wrap up, prolonged exposure to DON in broilers might evoke oxidative stress and intestinal inflammation. Another key component of the barrier function is by, done by the tight junction proteins. Tight junction proteins or complex proteins that constitute, for instance, by the, these claudine isoforms, zona occludens, and so on. Their physiological role is to regulate the paracellular transport or paracellular route in between epithelial cells. So actually they regulate the absorption of water or the transport of water and very small molecules too. Now, we and also other researchers in other animal species saw that, again, DON was responsible for damage to these tight junction proteins, uh, leading maybe to an enhanced paracellular transport of pathogens of xenobiotics in general. This was measured also by a marker, the TIR value. TIR stands for transepithelial electrical resistance, and it's the, the key marker of the barrier integrity here. So you see, again, the DON-contaminated diet was responsible for a significant reduction in tear. So this is for the paracellular route. We may not forget the other pathway of the barrier, namely the transcellular route. That means transport over the cells, not in between the cells. The best known route here is shown by this arrow, namely the transport over cells that can be evoked by proteins, thus transporter proteins more specifically. These transporter proteins recognize certain nutrients, like some amino acids, they, they catch them in, in the gut lumen, and they transport them over the cells to the portal blood and systemic circulation. That's the best well-known route. But 
there are some two other routes, huh, which are often forgotten. The second one is shown here, where a compound is recognized by a transported protein, but is, when it's entered the cells, it's immediately pumped out or effluxed again to the lumen. That's why they are called efflux proteins. And one major example, uh, I don't know if somebody has a suggestion, of the best known efflux protein in man and animals, also present in the blood-brain barrier, in the liver, uh, kidney. Who makes a guess? Nobody. It's P-glycoprotein, or PGP, P for permeability regulating protein. So it regulates the permeability to the barrier. Huh? Uh, Collies, for instance, ha can have a mutation, and they don't have this P-glycoprotein in their blood barrier, uh, blood-brain barrier. Hmm? Then the third level is mediated by cytochrome P450 enzymes, or SIPs, huh? and these actually have a total different mode of action. These biotransform xenobiotics, veterinary drugs or mycotoxins, to metabolites which are hopefully not active anymore. Like this, the parent compound is transformed to metabolites, which are then absorbed by the blood. So these two, efflux and SIPs, are also kind of protection mechanism of the body. So in the next few slides, I will show you some selected examples of the effect of fusarium mycotoxins at each of these three levels. Let's first start with the nutrient transporters. A classical design of an animal trial here is one-day-old chicks raised for 15 days with either a control diet or a non-contaminated diet, a fumonazins diet or a combination of both to see possible synergistic or antagonistic additive effects. Remark that the contamination level is again about this maximum guidance level for Europe. Next, samples of the jejunum were collected of these birds and analyzed by PCR for several genes. For instance, genes encoding for digestive enzymes, selected amino acid transporters, peptide, sugar and mineral transporters. <coughs> these transporters are located either at the brush border or at the basolateral uh, membrane of the enterocytes. This is the complete list of transporters that were studied. And DON and fumonisins might have an effect, or at least in our study here, for these five transporters. I won't go into detail for all five. I will show you two examples of the zinc transporter and the cationic amino acid transporter one. First, for the zinc transporter, you immediately see results in all three groups compared to the control diet. We have a significant reduction, a downregulation in the expression of this transporter. Now, you must know this transporter is located at the basolateral membrane, and its role is to export zinc from the cell to the portal blood. So it's a kind of efflux pumping out into the blood this time, into circulation. So zinc is an essential micronutrient. It regulates enzyme activities and so on. What is now the meaning of this finding, of these results? We see reduced expression of this zinc transporter. That would mean that's a kind of a natural protection mechanism, let's say, to keep the intracellular zinc concentration preserved during periods of oxidative stress evoked by DON. For the cationic 1 transporter, similar effect is seen, but only for the fumonisin group. This transporter is responsible for the efflux of selected amino acids like lysine and arginine. So a downregulation here in the fumonisin group means the same 
protection. It's a kind of preservation of these key uh, compounds intracellularly. Good. The second level is PGP uh, transporters. We looked for a multiple drug resistance protein. That's the gene encoding PGP and also uh, MLP2. At one glance, one sees a significant upregulation in the feminazine or the combination group for PGP, not for the other one. So selected substrates here would be pumped out more efficiently. Also kind of protection mechanism. Now, in my opinion, it would be very interesting, since you might know that substrates for PGP, I can give you one example, it's androfloxacin. Androfloxacin is recognized by PGP and pumped out partially back into the lumen. So, after exposure to feminazines, what would be the consequence for the absorption of androfloxacin? Maybe it can be reduced, so less bioavailability of this antibiotic. This has to be tested. If we look to this cytochrome P450 enzymes, similar effects were seen in the feminazine-only group for all three studied SIPs. So prolonged exposure to feminazines made my result here in an increased expression. Finally, we now know several fusarium mycotoxins might impair the intestinal barrier. What are now the practical consequences for the field of this? One might think of an enhanced susceptibility and translocation of enteric pathogens. This has been reviewed by our group. Or to an altered digestion of essential nutrients. Altered absorption of xenobiotics like veterinary drugs or other mycotoxins. I have no time to show you examples of the three stages. I will only give one example of the first one, the susceptibility to enteric infections, and we chose the necrotic enteritis because I'm very lucky to work at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Ghent. We have their beautiful infections models, for instance, this one with Clostridium perfringens. We saw that both DON and also feminazines are a predisposing factor for the development of this disease. We did some experimental work with four groups, all received Clostridium perfringens, but with or without mycotoxins and their combinations. Again, concentration levels here. And you can see here macroscopically the lesions and the Clostridial growth here. These are the results expressed as the percentage of birds with lesions. This is the control group. That's our normal Clostridium model. We expect this. And then the different mycotoxins were responsible for an, a higher percentage, significantly higher. You see, the combination group has no additive effect. So possibly the mode of action of both toxins is different. In an attempt to look and to try to explain these findings, we analyzed the total protein content in the several segments of the intestine and only in the duodenum we saw a significantly higher concentration of intestinal proteins available, available for clostridial proliferation. So we end up with our hypothesis. DON impairs the barrier at the villus, at the tight junction proteins. This might lead to a leaky gut. Plasma amino acids can leak and can be the essential nutrients for bacterial proliferation and eventual overgrowth of virulent Clostridium perfringens leading to necrotic enteritis. <coughs> okay. I come to the end and to the conclusions, take home message. Fusarium mycotoxins impair intestinal surface area. We saw the reduced villus heights. They also might impair the paracellular route by damaging tight junctions. Also the transcellular route by damaging several transporter proteins, both for nutrient and for veterinary drug uptake. And this finally might lead to an enhanced susceptibility to enteric infections. So 
uh, start with thanking my collaborations at Ghent, my colleagues from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Philippe van Emmerzeel, Richard Tukatelle and their groups, Sarah de Zahar from the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences and colleagues here uh, mentioned. I also have to thank Biomin and Virginia Tech University for their support and I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Siska. Actually, we will have uh, time for discussion afterwards for the questions. So please, I'm sure with this interesting presentation, you will have some. We will have three uh, more presenters, and then you will have the question session. Thank you, okay. Siska.